Hi everyone, thank you um, for joining us today. So we've had a bit, bit of a delay, some technical issues. Um, one of our guest panellists hasn't been able to join the Zoom meeting as of yet, but we'll, we'll kick off and we'll make a start. And um, then as he joins joins the chat, we can um, we can introduce him into the conversation. So uh, thank you all for, for joining us this morning. It's the second in our uh, second of our discussions in our Soil and Roots series hosted by Tatva. Um, if some of you are not familiar with um, the work that Tatva does, it's um, really about uh, nurturing creative talent and um, really um, having a network of uh, creative leadership and to incubate ideas as well. So um, part of our work is geared towards um, open incubation, open research sessions such as this, um, where we explore a particular theme in an open-minded and critical way um, in, in search of its essence. So um, the, the Soil and Roots uh, series of conversations um, that, that we've been um, having this over these, these three days around migration, integration, connection, and today we will be discussing the second of those, so integration. Um, by way of introduction, I am Jazz Kaur Sharma. Uh, I recently wrote a paper on women, tradition and in India, but my personal um, in areas of interest and in research lie broadly in social theory um, and humanities. And um, kind of rooted in my experience being a grandchild of um, Indian immigrants and growing up in the, in the Midlands in the 90s and 2000s, trying to navigate that, um, I've really become interested in the the ideas of identity, of acceptance and balancing cultures. And so I'm incredibly excited um, and honored today to be able to have this conversation. Um, and we've got um, here with us today, we have uh, Manisha Wilmet to discuss the topic of, of um, integration as well. So um, I'll just give uh, Manisha a brief, a brief introduction. So um, in the 1960s, Manisha G was active in the longest student strike in US history at San Francisco State University and became a lecturer in the first black studies department, which was won by that strike. Um, in 1984, she was a leading organizer of the first conference of women of color and immigrant women ever held in the UK in Camden. She is the author of of Black Women and the Peace Movement and Roots, Black Ghetto Ecology. She's attained a master's degree in values um, in education from the University of London. And more recently, Manisha G is a yoga student and has worked with Swami Ambikananda on the pioneering translations of the Kata Upanishad and the Uddhav Gita and on co-founding the Traditional Yoga Association, um, an educational charity. So thank you so much, Manisha G, for joining me today. It's really, it really is great to have you and um, to kind of get your, your thoughts and views and experiences um, on this topic. Um, so with introductions kind of introductions and formalities out of the way, I'd like to, to kick off if I could with you. Um, and really, I guess, when talking about integration, it's such a it's such an interesting topic and an interesting word, and it's linked so intrinsically to to the concept of migration, and it, it really is the the what happens next. So, um, you know, settling into a new life, into a new cultural framework, but that term integration means many different things to many different people. So, I just wanted to start by framing the conversation a little bit and ask you, what does integration mean to you? Uh, integration to me, actually, I got a very uh, good definition that suited me to a T yeah. on Wednesday at the inauguration when Amanda Gorman recited her beautiful and so moving poem uh, called We Climb, The Hill We Climb. She said, we are striving to forge our union with purpose, to compose a country committed to all cultures, colors, characters and conditions of man. Now I know as someone who dabbles in poetry myself that a poet, no poet likes her words or his words to be changed. Yeah. But I would make a couple of amendments to that uh, line of hers. I would say to compose a world committed to all cultures, colors, characters and conditions of humanity, biodiversity, the environment, the planet. Uh, so that really sums it up. But principally, it starts with the common purpose, because without a common purpose, I don't think we can have immigration, uh, integration. We have immigration, but we don't have integration without a common purpose. 
No, that, that that's great. And I think, as you said, such a we're kind of having this conversation at quite a, a poignant time in terms of of, of, of history and uh, and um, the kind of the social landscape at the moment. So that, no, that that's that's really great. Thank you. My my next question, I guess, is kind of um, following on from that. You mentioned the, the US inauguration, and and um, you can obviously as well. Um, we just mentioned before that you started um, a lot of your your work in the US and then you, you moved here in the in the 60s. So you've actually lived in the UK longer than you have um, in the US. And I, I just wondered from from that kind of perspective and putting the spotlight onto modern Britain. Um, Britain is often described as a melting melting pot. Um, it's often described as a multicultural society. Um, but I think some people would argue or, or people may say that there is still a degree of segregation in some areas between migrant groups. And I just wondered, um, kind of from your perspective, does Britain, being a multi-ethnic country, do you feel that we experience a healthy amount of cross-group interaction or not? And has there been a failure um, in creating cultural cohesion? Uh, I, th I think there is a, a lot of um, integration in, in pockets, actually. Um, it, it's obviously not across the board because there are areas that you can go to where there are no people who aren't white. Yeah. Uh, and I remember uh, in my early active days in the peace movement uh, in the 80s, uh, people saying to me, well, there's no problem of race in our community because there aren't any black people. Yeah. Uh, so that, that was a common <laughs> one, really. Uh, and I think on the other hand, there are certain, there are communities of color where people are in a sense separating themselves from the rest of the society uh, and rarely going out of those boundaries. Uh, and that kind of self-separation can be a barrier to integration as well. So it, it, it's a mixed bag really, because at the same time, I know that Britain, for example, has one of the highest, if not the highest rates of intermarriage in the world. Yes, yeah. Uh, and I think it, it uh, is more, more than in the US, for example. Yeah. Um, and also uh, when you look at the arts in Britain, you do see a lot of uh, crossover and a lot of collaboration and in other spheres as well. So it's, it's very much a big, a, a mixed bag and healthy um, is, is a difficult word. I think, I think it's a work in progress. That's the key point. Yeah. There are going to be ups and downs and it is a hill that we climb rather than um, a fixed, uh, a finished product. Uh, and also, um, we have to really, the, the common purpose is quite essential because integration for what purpose? Integration, yeah. to, integration to join in exploiting each other? Yeah. Uh, because, for example, the, the British government, uh, at now anyway, has quite a few faces of people of color. Yes. But that doesn't mean that the conditions of people of color by and large have improved or are improving enough. So there, are there is integration at certain levels of power yeah. and which don't necessarily benefit the communities of color. What about Windrush and the, comp uh, and the compensation that has yet to be paid to people? Yeah. What about the air pollution standards that have yet to be rectified? Uh, what about the feeding of children, which is an issue which spans all communities, not only communities of color, but all low income communities. So it's what we need to work on, I think, is integration. Yeah, uh, I think that that's such a such an interesting point and a point that I've been thinking about myself is this the one that you brought up of like the purpose of integration. Um, and I think that there's a there's a relationship particularly with Britain and uh, that it has into its quote unquote more integrated co um, community migrant communities and less integrated migrant communities but it's understanding that integration it's a relationship and it's a process happening between two groups and um, you've got you've got to be mindful of the framework in which that that in that process is taking place um, 
and uh, it's kind of following on from some of the comments you made there is thinking do all forms of integration have an implicit hierarchy uh, you know we talk about host community versus migrant community sometimes it's one migrant community versus another and um, I think about the terms and the language itself as well you can be a migrant in one place but you're an expat in another um, so I just wanted your views in terms of um, that that kind of hierarchy within the framework or when we're talking about integration how, how do we make ensure that those kind of um, those kind of issues and, and that that kind of foundation is still um, kind of maintained on a level footing almost. Yes, I think I think you're right that it, that it does proceed on integration does proceed on different levels, and that people who have uh, a certain stand a higher standard of living are able to integrate perhaps more easily uh, in what you might call lifestyle activities. Uh, whereas people who, are, who only see each other at work and not in their home communities may not be integrating. So there is a stratification, I think, in the integration process. But I think that nevertheless, integration is actually essential for all of us in our communities of color because of the hierarchy in those communities themselves. Um, I know with the, the history of the lesbian and gay movement, it was absolutely essential that lesbian and gay people from communities of color were able to get together on the basis of being lesbian or gay with white people, Europeans, who were further along in coming out uh, and where people were being told, well, if you're, if you're gay, you're not Asian, or if you're gay, you're not really black or African. Uh, and that's still a problem that a lot of people of color are still facing, but having access to people from other ethnic backgrounds actually was so empowering for people who were suffering exploitation within their own communities. I mean, before you get even to the question of lesbian and gay people, there is first of all the issue of women yeah. and the way that women are very often at the bottom of our ethnic minority communities. And it's absolutely essential that they have access to the power of women from other communities. Yeah. For their, it, it's, it's essential to their lives uh, that they have that access. So integration needs to take place in services in refuges, uh, in, in education, wherever it can possibly take place. We need that uh, cross um, cooperation, that co cooperation and collaboration. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's a lifeline, literally a lifeline. Yeah, I think you're, I think you're so right, right on that point there. Um, and I guess kind of following on from that, it, it's the, the impact uh, the impact of integration on your personal personal identity and how, how that impacts you. I know something that um, I have definitely kind of, um, it's been a journey for me from being younger and maybe perhaps distancing myself um, from, my, from my heritage and my background with the view that potentially it would make me um, more palatable, more successful in my career, more successful socially if I was to do that and then coming through the journey and understanding the importance of staying connected while being integrated as well. So that kind of balance balance between cultures in terms of um, when we're thinking about integration and, and I guess with your kind of lived experience of different identities I, I would love to hear from you around um, kind of how you feel integration impacts on identity. Uh, do you feel like it can lead to people distancing themselves from their homeland? And if you have got two, di two identities that you're navigating, what criteria do you use to navigate and understand what the right balance is? Right, that's, that's a big question. It is a big question. Yeah, just yeah. throwing it out there, yeah. Yeah, I, I, think it, I think it gets back to actually fundamental values and, and how you see the purpose of your life even. Uh, because Hinduism has a lot to say about identity. Um, that's my spiritual framework for that. 
Yeah. And in particular, um, Patanjali, the sage of yoga, uh, talked about how we can identify with any number of identities. There's a whole stream of identities out there. But the question is, what is our real identity? And unless we, in a sense, still ourselves and get the habit of building our awareness of what it is we stand for and where we are going in our lives, we don't know at any moment what our true identity is. It is something that may seem to be what we've chosen, but which in fact is yet another imposed identity. So yeah. there's a constant inquiry as, as to what this identity is. But having said that, I think that the, there, need, there need not be a tension between the traditional community identity and the identity of say British society as a whole. Yeah. Because it actually, the values that come from our particular communities, whatever they are, uh, our particular religious traditions, can actually give us a way of, of making a contribution to the larger society and of grounding ourselves in that larger society. Where are we going? Where is the society going? Again, how are we climbing this hill? So uh, it's not inherently a tension. It's, not, it's something we have to work on. We always have to work on this project of yeah. identity and integration. No, that, that that's really that's really great I think uh, that way of um, kind of describing it and framing it is is so interesting because often um, it feels like uh, it's it seems like uh, that there's a, a given trade-off that um, between your place in society when you're integrating versus your connection and your place to your traditional or ancestral history so um, to kind of highlight that actually there need not be a tension there and and that's um, the kind of the, the concepts you touched upon about identity is uh, su super interesting as well. I think we've had a question from from someone uh, watching in, which is, is integration an equal responsibility between host and migrant communities? I think it is. I think it's a mutual responsibility uh, in the sense that it's a recognition of our history and, and how we got here in the first place. Uh, it was said last night in the discussion that we're here because the British Empire uh, was there, was where we came from. Yeah. So it is a mutual responsibility, I think, to, uh, to work on this project of integration. Uh, there, I, I don't think uh, British people have a right to just, in a blanket way, close the door to foreigners because... British society has been built and fought for by people of color from all over the world. Uh, even my father, who was in the American army, was stationed in Britain during yeah. World War II, uh, to say nothing of all of the uh, South Asian and African troops who fought for this country. Uh, and there are debts that are owed from that point of view. Uh, and we didn't ask, uh, we from Africa and Asia didn't ask to, we didn't invite these, um, these uh, companies into our lands to exploit us. Uh, and when they left, we were impoverished and they were enriched. So there is a historical obligation there. Uh, at the same time, uh, I think that we coming here have a right, have a duty to respect the people who are here. We can't come as freeloaders. We can't come here and say, uh, we, we want everything that the society has to offer, but we don't owe you anything. We don't yeah. have to contribute anything. We do have to contribute. We yeah. are because, we're t because fundamentally, again, these identities are quite superficial. The basic identity is humanity. And the basic issue is how do we behave towards each other and how do we behave towards all other species and the planet? And we have to work together for, to save our lives and, uh, and all our lives. And when we come here, we have to respect the people who have worked to make this country. 
as even coming in here as an American, I have an obligation of citizenship towards people in Britain. I can't just expect things. I have to contribute something. Yeah. So, uh, and I think that's true of every immigrant who comes here, but also our contributions need to be recognized. Yeah. And, and also our contributions need, need to not be stereotyped that in such a way that our contribution is only to go to our jobs and work and keep our mouths shut. Our contribution is also one of transformation. Part of our contribution is the difference that we bring to this country. The fact that we do have these other cultures, that we have these other religions is part of our contribution because these cultures and religions have enriched Western civilization. There's so much that you can look at that is now commonplace in Western thinking, which is, to cut a long story short, a ripoff from India. And when I say ripoff, I'm not talking about, I'm saying it's a ripoff in the sense that it's not acknowledged where it came from. Of course, we have to share cultures. I'm not, that's in itself, sharing is not cultural appropriation. But cultural appropriation is taking these goods, these cultural goods, and not acknowledging where they came from and the blood, sweat, and tears that went into creating them. And so our, our cultures are contributions to this society. And also the transformative work we do is a contribution. I've been uh, very much inspired by the campaigning of Rosamund Kisi Debra. She campaigned for seven years on behalf of her little girl who died from an asthma attack brought on by air pollution. Now, her campaigning is going to benefit, is already benefiting the whole society. She didn't keep her mouth shut because she was an African immigrant. She spoke up in defense of her daughter's life. And that has enriched and empowered this entire society. Because air pollution is the number one environmental killer in the UK. So that's also a co contribution that we make as immigrants. Yeah, I, th I think you've, you've raised some very powerful issues there around both, like you mentioned, contribution, but also around the sort of symbiotic relationship and partnership between um, host countries and, and uh, migrant uh, and migrant communities. And I think that's an incredibly important point. It's not a one way integration that that's not how integration works or indeed should work. Um, and I guess another part of that that you you touched upon at the beginning of of um, of your of your answer there was um, talking about um, you, uh, you mentioned um, kind of people fighting for Britain when they never even visited, you know, visited the country. Um, the the kind of uh, big, the the waves of migration that have been due to colonialism and empire and the rest of it, and I think there's also the question that can the framework for integration created by a colonialist ideology ever be successful? No, is the short answer. Yeah, of course. Yeah, no. yeah, no. because it, it's clueless really, without valuing our experience and without respecting our contribution and our definitions of what needs to change and what the values need to be. Uh, it's a house of cards, really. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There is, there's, and there's no way around that. And uh, to, to pretend that it can be a top-down framework of integration is really just another smokescreen for further exploitation. Yeah. You no, know, once you invade, once you built an empire, you lost the right to tell the people from that empire what they should be doing, even in your own country, because you've, you yourself have said, my country is no longer my country because it's being fed and enriched by these other people. Therefore, these other people must have a right uh, to have a say in this. So yeah. we, we can't, we can never es escape that moral uh, 
that moral obligation, really. No, of course. And that mutual responsibility yeah. for the future. No, it's a, it's, a, it's a very interesting point, I think, especially doing my research and uh, being in this country, because it, often your the conversation is always framed uh, from one direction in terms of what integration means. So I think it's really important, actually, to open up that conversation and think about alternative narratives as well around actually what does integration actually mean when we talk about it for both parties involved and have a bit more of a, um, a three-dimensional conversation I think I think that's really really important um, we have had another question actually come in from from um, someone watching as well which is is multi-ethnic plus unified culture a better model than multiculturalism so um, culture defined as a common set of values that are not bound to a particular ethnicity hmm. culture defined by well um, culture defined uh, culture defined as a common set of values not bound to a particular ethnicity yeah so I, I think that is part of the definition of culture yeah certainly. Uh, because it's not only about um, clothes you wear or language you speak. Culture is everything that you do. It's the, the, uh, the way that you live your life, the job, the, the job that you have, the way you relate to other people, all of that. And we are talking about uh, trying to find ways that that culture can belong to all of us or does belong to all of us. We can all participate in it. Yeah. Yeah. So culture is not um, culture is not just a decoration. Yes. Uh, yeah, and, understood. Yeah. Great. I'm also I'm I'm conscious that um, we haven't had a chance for um, David Goodhart to join us on the on the call today as well. But um, his I would say that his perspective is quite is quite different uh, in the terms uh, when it comes to multiculturalism um, specifically. So he's written quite extensively um, about um, almost the 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 failure of multiculturalism in Britain today. Um, I think he um, there was a particular article um, a few a few years ago around diversity and saying you know is Britain too diverse um, and it kind of. Um, I guess it's the it's a, a contrary view in terms of um, very much based in the fact that actually multiculturalism doesn't work um, and it is a bit of a myth um, f to kind of expect it to as well because you've got so many differing and competing values, value sets and experiences. So I just wondered, um, kind of in the absence of David, just bringing that, 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 that thread into the conversation, um, just wondered what your thoughts were on that. Uh, oh, wow. <laughs> it's just, it's so divorced from reality. Um, I think multiculturalism, any ism, I, I don't, I myself don't like any ism. Yeah, me too. Once you, once you attach ism to something, uh, racism, feminism, multiculturalism, yeah. you're in, in trouble. Of course, uh, yeah. And you're, you're creating some kind of fict fiction, which is then imposed on other people. And you have the people who are doing the imposing and the people who are imposed upon. So I also, I mean, I don't find anything meaningful in the concept of multiculturalism. But I think what people were trying to get at is that we have to find some ways to live together in a diverse society. Yeah. Uh, and the whole world is diverse and Britain is diverse. And there's no way to escape that. This yeah. is a dangerous fantasy, really. And it's a, it's a murderous fantasy, in fact, because a lot of people died before they got their Windrush compensation and recognition of their right to be here, having been invited to be here to work, for example. Yeah, uh, and I mean, I, I won't get into the list of exploitations that that people of color have suffered, but also uh, the diversity is a value, is an asset. And on a global scale, I think part of the freakout that is going on on different levels in academia uh, and on the part of intellectuals like David, 
as well as at a grassroots level on the part of uh, various racist zealots is that is finally they are recognizing that they are the minority in the world. I think that's part of the freak out that's going on in the United States by, uh, uh, and was so fed by Donald Trump. And this uh, kind of last ditch effort to say, we're going to set the rules. The cat is already out of the bag. This is, this is over. What has to happen now is how can we share these resources? That to me is the question. And there isn't going to be any health on any level of society without us sharing the resources. Uh, I was interested, uh, I was looking at David's uh, most recent book, Head, Head Hand, Heart, mm -hmm. um, where he talks about trying to rebalance the culture. Uh, but the final word of the book is enterprise. So somehow this rebalancing is again back to the old theme of enterprise. Another word, an earlier word for enterprise was empire. empire but those yeah. days are over. And just as white Americans are having to face the fact that they are increasingly not the majority and some are welcoming it, some are embracing. And that was the coalition that won a new presidency. Yeah. They actually did win. There actually was a majority, an integrated majority that voted for Biden. That was an example of integration. Let's look concretely at what is possible. It wasn't a huge majority, but it was the majority. Uh, and to try to hold the fort and say, no, now there's going to be, uh, you know, we have to set the framework. It, it's over, it's not possible. So the question is, how do we set that framework? How do we pool our resources from these different backgrounds to accomplish a new framework? One of the things that David in his latest book skips over uh, or dismisses actually is the work of Sir Michael Marmot, who has talked about health disparities and how they are killing us, how poor people of whatever color are dying because we lack access to basic necessities of healthy living, healthy food, healthy uh, water, healthy housing, etc. but also how the stress levels are actually leading to metabolic syndrome, which is the precursor of type two diabetes, heart disease, and all of the other comorbidities that are, that are so, uh, so significant in the effects of COVID. So the pandemic goes right back to those health disparities. And for David to dismiss those, that issue uh, as I don't know what, you know, as well, stre everybody has stress, actually, is how he dismisses it. There's stress at all levels. It's not only uh, poor people who are stressed or low status people who are stressed. You, it can't be dismissed. Yeah. And uh, I think that. And that's think... another, I mean, that's another model of integration. And where I, 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 that's where I want you to go is actually to Marcus Rashford, because I yeah. think. There's no blueprint for in integration. There is no blueprint. It's a work in progress. People are doing different things to try to organize themselves. And it's up to each one of us to do what he or she can. But Marcus Rashford, I'm so proud of him because he has set a pathway for all people in this country to be healthier, yeah. to feed all children Although he, part of his springboard was Black Lives Matter, he didn't stop with Black children being hungry like he had been hungry. He said, I remember hearing him say in one inter early interview that when children aren't properly fed, they feel like they don't matter. He meant all children feel like they don't matter. And what has happened is that he has actually become part of a kind of coalition or campaign of people from celebrity chefs to Henry Dimbleby working on his national food strategy, uh, to Prune Leaf, to all kinds of people who are working on this issue of 
the economic justice that needs to be accomplished. Michael Marmot having done the research on an international level to show that it is social injustice which is making us sick and making us vulnerable to COVID. So that's the kind of plan I think or, or direction that or per perspective really that we need to be taking not enterprise that is over. Yeah uh, and it's uh, I think you, you kind of touched on there one of the the, the later questions I had, which was around this whole idea of what does the future of integration look like and what is the blueprint for, for integration? I think one thing that I find quite interesting is um, sometimes in the, the mainstream discourse and the narrative, um, the nuances between integration in different groups isn't always completely clear. It gets bucketed um, often as it's blanket integration and, and, and um, that I think it, it's, um, it would be remiss to do it in, in that way in, in, in some sense, because each, um, each kind of migrant group has its own challenges, its own struggles, its own value set, its own experience, and, and it's, uh, it's very different um, for each of those. And I think linking on to that, we've had another question from the audience, which is, Britain is considered multicultural. However, there seems to be big cities where ethnic groups are divided and they don't communicate with one another. And the question here is, how can we encourage meaningful conversations? So how can we, how can we open up that dialogue and, and how can we um, encourage um, a bit more um, partnership and cohesion between some of these groups? Right, I, I think it is around a common purpose again, yeah. uh, because you see, when you see the photos of people organizing the food banks, you see people from all kinds of backgrounds. Uh, I know that the Sikh community have, have done a lot in feeding people yeah. in all kinds of crises. Earlier when there was flooding, uh, they were doing it years ago. Uh, they've been doing it in the North with flooding. Now they're doing it in relation to uh, the feeding of the children. You see white working class people volunteering at food banks. You see Christian communities volunteering and so on. So when we when we focus on actually something that we can work on together, I think is when we get to know each other in the course of that work. And I, th I think you might have um, had in mind perhaps the whole BAME nonsense. Uh, it just annoys me. I know it. Yeah, it annoys me as well, yeah. yeah. Is, I feel actually there should be a little bracket in there, a bracketed L, so it's actually BLAME. Yeah, somehow this bane thing what is that and it's again it's a way of ticking a box and pretending that uh, ethnic issues are being acknowledged but at the same time not really getting down to cases with it you know so I think the specificity of our community needs does have to be recognized uh, and our our cultural peculiarities and, and particularities have to be acknowledged not peculiarities, that was a wrong choice of words, but our, um, our particular identities must be respected and must be learned from. I know, um, you know as, as a, a person from an African American Christian background, going to um, a Hindu temple for the first time, I could see different people were puzzling, you know, like, what's this? You know, what's she doing here? Kind of thing. But I wasn't offended by it because it was an acknowledgement, yes, this is something new that's happening. And at the same time, I was uh, getting involved in something that was new for me. And over a course of many years, mutual respect has come from that working together, that learning uh, each other's experiences, learning the chanting, learning the rituals, and so on. So that there is a real, certainly on my part, an appreciation of what I am learning. And I think a respect for me as a human being, they're being willing to learn. So I think that these things are not overnight. And there yeah. are these hang-ups between different communities of color. But um, as Professor Shaw was saying last night, there is also there are also all these examples of of cooperation and good feeling that happen, and we just have to build on that. Yeah, 
It's really, it's really interesting because you've meant you've commented a lot on this idea of a common purpose and I think usually when it comes to conversations of integration it's it's not the word purpose that usually is at the forefront it's values it's common values common laws co that that's kind of where the conversation is grounded and not necessarily purpose so perhaps shifting the conversation slightly into common purpose is another um potential way to be able to um to sort of start thinking about what that blueprint actually looks like when we're talking about uh, talking about integration. Um, we have had another question from the audience. So um, this is um, the colonial identity sustains itself by occupying the center of the ring. This centrism is about power. It has never been relinquished voluntarily so far. Does Manisha G think it's possible? I, yes, actually, I do think it's possible in the sense that uh, certainly individual, I, I think that it's important not to stereotype people, just as we don't want to be stereotyped as people of color or different communities of color. I think it's uh, important not to stereo, stereotype anybody by background. I think that this these centers of empire or whatever are very much a mixed bag. And the anti-colonial struggles had a lot of support from Europeans, perhaps not as much as we would have liked and not enough, e enough eventually in combination with our own resistance to actually bring victory. So it's, it's, we shouldn't lump everybody who's from a metropolitan identity as being uh, in need of overthrowing. There's a whole, you know, someone I think of in this regard is, is George Mombayo, the environmentalist. He's one of these Eaton crowds, this Eaton type person in by education, who is really doing fantastic work on the environment, which benefits everyone, and fantastic work using his background to expose what is going on with ecology in this country. And I think any such contribution is welcome. I think the more people who come from a powerful background, a wealthy background, who are part of this hereditary kind of elite in this country, the more of them who are ready to actually put what they know at the service of making a better world, the better off we all are. We're all in the, we are all in this together and we have to not bar anyone on the basis of where they have come from. Just as we don't wanna be barred on the basis of where we've come from. Yeah. No, of course. Um, so many, so many interesting points and so many threads that to unravel and 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 uh, kind of delve deeper into for sure. Um, there's another question, which is, what do you think about movements which call for no borders and the right to free movement for all, regardless of what um, people are deemed able or willing to contribute? That's, that's very difficult, that's very difficult. Um, because I think that everyone who comes has to be willing to, con to contribute to where, you are to where you are coming to. Okay, yeah. You, ha you have to be ready to contribute. You can't expect to uh, import um, discrimina discrimination against women, for example, on the basis that, well, this is my culture women are inferior and therefore when I go to Europe, this is what I'm going to continue with. Or when I go to America, this is what I'm going to continue with. No, it's not acceptable. So that's one aspect of the question. The other question I think is the whole world cannot move to someplace else. So that fundamental driver of migration in ecological devastation and poverty of large areas of the world has to be resolved. And that's partly 
the responsibility of the Western governments and corporations and so on that profit from that ecological devastation. But it's also a responsibility of the elites in those countries. And people are going, you know, we're going to have to deal with those elites. And that's not only something that can be done from the outside. Those elites also have to be dismantled from within their own countries. Uh, and also some of them hopefully will make a transition or transformation to dismantling themselves and you know, stop with the corruption and the exploitation. But there's not much sign of that. But yeah. it's, a big, it's a big, big issue. But open borders doesn't, so, a slogan like off open borders doesn't address all that is involved, I think, in tackling that tackling question. It. Uh, no, th thank you. Thank you for that. I, I think also your, your point about contribution for me particularly is really interesting because I think, um, I feel like I've personally experienced or I think there is such a thing at the moment of what I would describe as superficial integration so you can have people or communities who are law-abiding citizens they go to work they pay their taxes they do everything kind of by the letter of the legislation of the law of that country but when it comes to true integration and what that means in terms of um, uh, being in a in a host country or having grown up second, third generation, um, still feel, um, can often feel, in some ways it's a good thing, more connected to their homeland and more connected with with um, kind of their, their heritage, et cetera. But that can sometimes, the pendulum can also swing quite far in that direction as well. So I just wanted to know your thoughts around that. And is, is it enough to uh, I think I know, know the answer from having spoken to you, but is it, is it enough to just abide by the laws of a country or does there really need to be something deeper that's going on there when we talk about integration? I think the problem, I think there's a real deficit on citizenship generally. I think a lot of the so-called host communities are not interested in being good citizens. I, I think that that, that goes across all of us because people are very turned off generally of whatever community we're from, uh, in whatever community we're from, by the state of politics, uh, the state of the world, and feelings of powerlessness. And well, I'll just get what I can uh, and make a comfortable life. I'll get a job that gives me an income, that gives me a house, that pays my bills, gives me a holiday, either in some, how, you know, in some second home in this country or that enables me to travel back, in the case of ethnic communities, it enables me to travel back to my homeland when I want to for holidays and so on, or it enables me to send money back. That's the state of life, I think, for a great many people. Real questions of real, what does it mean to be a citizen? And how do I take responsibility for this community, country, world that I'm living in to make it a better place? I think it's, it's actually, unfortunately, far removed from many people's minds. So yeah. there's a deep, there's, that question, I think, applies across the board. Yes, I mean, it's better to be law-abiding than not. But on the other hand, which laws are you abiding by? Are, are you abiding by the exploitative ones as well, or are, are you simply, you know, follow, again, no transformation? Yeah. You know, the, the air can be as dirty as you like, etc. There can be as much plastic in the ocean as you like, but we don't need to change anything. Don't rock the boat. There is that don't rock the boat uh, thing, which is very widespread, but. Uh, it gets that then gets back to what does life mean? Yeah, we, you know, what does life mean? You know, I, I'm sorry, it, it actually does come back to that. Yeah, like, no. what is the spiritual and ethical framework that people are living according to? Yeah, it, it's it's interesting you talk about 
uh, don't, not rocking the boat. And I think that's something that um, I think I've, I probably would phrase in different ways. It's also about playing the game almost. So, um, and I think um, there is a, there is often this when we talk when there's a discussion about integration going on in the same breath we there is a the talk of assimilation so it's that that integration versus assimilation and and therefore therefore what does that mean but just reflecting on something you said a little bit earlier which was um around um the contribution of people coming into coming into a country and, and what they bring and being mindful of um not importing certain um, ideas or, or, or values, as it were, with them, um, and just from my, from from kind of building on that and trying to unravel that a little bit, um, this idea of people bringing in cultures that could be seen as discrimi discriminatory, for example, um, do you believe then that that should mean that people should either change or delete those cultural practices? How how does how does that kind of um, balance um, work do you think in terms of um, that that uh, tradition or that I idea still existing in their framework? Yes I think those I think those oppressive practices that are going on in all kinds of different cultures around the world do need to be overcome. I think that it, it reminds me that Western society has accomplished some positive things. Western liberal democracies have actually accomplished some positive things and have some positive values. It matters that women have the right to vote. It matters that uh, battering women is illegal, even though it's not enforced as much as it should be. Um, it matters that women can work outside the home if they choose to. It matters that women can drive a car. It matters that lesbian, gay, and transgender people aren't attacked by mobs for being who they are. You know, so these are accomplishments of Western societies which are positive. And that, to me, gives is part of what gives Western societies, in fact, fundamentally what gives Western societies a right to insist upon certain things, certain mutual agreement about the values. Yet there are some positive things that have been accomplished by Western liberal democracies. Some of them, in the re I might add, in the recent period, have been accomplished partly through the influence of the civil rights movement, which was, again, people who were not in you know, led by people who were not immigrants, but who certainly were treated like immigrants, even though we had been in the country for 400 years, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, um, so there, you know, but that gives the, those accomplishments on behalf of humanity, the common purpose of humanity moving to some kind of higher level, give Western societies the right to say, no, you cannot bring in policies which, uh, contradict these values which we have established. When you become a citizen, you have to pledge allegiance to British values. And if by British values you mean uh, not discriminating against women, uh, for example, yes, that is a value that should be pledged allegiance to. And, and changes do have to happen. And people are fighting for those changes in the countries from which migration is happening. So it's, these are not just being imposed from the West as a condition of migration. Those battles are going on in each of those countries, which is part of why some people are migrating here. Yeah, it's, uh, I think there's uh, further into the, as we kind of delve further into the the conversation, there are so many layers to to this, and so many lenses and strands in which you can take. And I actually really think it is a shame that David hasn't been able to join us today as well, because I think we would have had some really really interesting conversations on some of these topics in terms of um, kind of the, uh, uh, I guess a, a slightly 
uh, well, it, it's an alternative view, isn't it? And kind of opening that that out. We we have had a, had another question coming in from someone who who's watching, which is um, religious and other institutions exist to preserve othering based identity and prevent community based organic integration. Do we need to work actively to abolish their identity politics? Well, I don't agree with the premise of the statement that religious communities uh, promote othering. I think, I think that some religious communities do promote othering. I think that within each religion, there is actually a struggle about what the religion stands for. Yeah. And there are those within the religion who stand for othering and all kinds of forms of exploitation and those who are trying to use the values of their religion to make a better world for everyone. Martin Luther King was a Christian. He had, he had to fight other Christians to build the civil rights movement. A lot of his letter to a Birmingham jail is a critique of what was happening within white Christianity in America. And it's still going on because there is the whole Christian evangelical backing of Donald Trump, for example. But that doesn't mean that all Christians are doing that. On the other hand, many, many Christians are involved in social justice struggles of all kinds. So we, we can't, um, again, have a stereotype of Thank any you. religion that is just uh, this backward negative thing that promotes othering. It can promote unity, it can promote uh, mutuality, it can promote working together and social justice. And I think we have to approach it from that point of view. And it can promote meaning, which is lacking a great deal in the society, and which people are not finding in politics very often. No, I, I think that's, um, it, it's, uh, oh, I think we just said, is it okay to slightly adjust your mic? I think there's, there's a bit of interference coming through, but is that okay? No, and all, all very interesting points there as well. I think the, the, uh, the nuances that there are so many blanket statements that get brought, get brought out in these kind of topics. And it's, it's kind of our responsibility to, critique but also to under, to make a real effort to understand those nuances and not just um kind of uh have the the sweeping statements that that often do do a, do kind of support um and uh come alongside of these conversations so so that's great um i i think we we are um, coming to the, nearly the end of our, our hour here. It's been slightly different in terms of the format of what was expected. Um, I guess that's, that's, that's show business, as they say. So we, we, we just carried on. But I just wanted to say um, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for speaking so openly and passionately about these topics and giving your, your views and your, your experiences. I've, I feel like um, these are conversations this is one in the start of a conversation that I know I want to have and further my research and further my my thinking on this topic to be able to to really um, kind of understand and and, and get to, to the root of some of these these, these areas. So I really do thank you for for giving up your 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 time on a Saturday morning to to be here and and share some of your views. Um, I just wondered if you had sort of any kind of final comment or parting um, parting words or or anything like that. As uh, we've covered a lot today, a whole raft of ideas, and I just wondered if um, to wrap to wrap this up from from your perspective, if there was anything you you wanted to just highlight. Right. Well, well, I actually I want to thank you for your work that you're doing. Uh, and the exploration that you're involved in. It gives me hope, it gives me inspiration to see another generation or two generations even uh, <laughs> who are tackling these issues in, in a way that was, is way beyond, in a sense, some places where we reached uh, in the same way that Amanda Gorman uh, gave me hope. And I'd like to also thank Tatva for uh, giving us the platform, Tatva Vivika, which is a great name. Um, giving us this platform to uh, have our discussion uh, and just carry on because you all, your generation has, I'm expecting great things of you. 
uh, and really, really just carry on. No, th- thank you so much for those words. They, they, they definitely, they definitely mean a lot. Um, so I think we've we've come to the the end of our our discussion, um, and um, I think we've had a lot of questions and engagement from people um, tuning in and, and and listening in. So so that's been really great, and I think. Um, if anybody wants to leave any feedback or find out more, they, they can go to the Tatva um, website, but also um, just um, flagging that there is another discussion happening tomorrow as well. So that's the third in the series, um, the final Soil and Roots panel discussion, which is on connection, which should also be it's kind of the, the final part in the journey and should also be a really great, great discussion. So just wanted to, to say um, thank you to everyone and thank you, Manisha G, very much for your time. Um, and uh, wishing everyone a, a, a good a good rest of re- rest of the day and good rest of the lockdown weekend. So thank you very much. Thank you.